Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module number 3, Biological Diversity. This is video number 6 and we're going to be looking at physiological adaptations. So our learning intention with this particular video is for us to be able to examine the physiological adaptations of different organisms that increase their ability to survive in their environment. So just as we looked at some of the structural adaptations of different types of organisms, now we're going to focus on the physiological ones. What we need to do is we need to look at physiological adaptations. And physiological adaptations are basically ones that focus on how the body functions. So some internal ways that the body works. So what we need to do is look at a couple of these different examples um, in the area of, say, chemical tolerances, in the area of chemical secretions or reproductive strategies, where it's actually the way that the body is working that gives us some clue to um, the physiology involved. Maybe to give you one quick example, if we looked at an organism that had a kidney. Now, a kidney is actually a structure. So the presence of kidneys gives us um, a structure, a particular structural adaptation. However, if the kidneys function in such a way to regulate or perhaps um, to uh, regulate salt levels, Both of these are physiological functions. They're how the body works. So do the kidneys have a particular way of being able to um, control how much water is lost by the body in the urine? Or can they reabsorb some of the salts to maintain the levels of salt within the organism? This is a function rather than a structure. So while a kidney might be a structure, the way that the kidney functions makes it then a physiological adaptation. So chemical tolerances may um, come back to things like salt levels. And we do notice there's a lot of different organisms that may either prefer freshwater environments or saltwater environments, or sometimes um, changing environments. Chemical secretions uh, may include things like production of poisons. So we know that there are certain organisms, both plants and animals, that are poisonous. And that's a great mechanism, a protection mechanism uh, against being eaten. And even things like reproductive strategies, which could include things like different cycles, uh, like periods of gestation, uh, or the, the actual uh, fecundity, the number of different eggs that can be produced. All of these are different types of physiological adaptations. So let's look at a couple of these in a little bit more detail. So just as we did with the structural adaptations, what we can do is look at a number of different organisms and try and get a sense of what it is that each of these organisms can actually uh, do or some function of the way that the body is working that tells us something about um, how that assists the organism to survive. So we've got a little mountain pygmy possum right here. This is the little mountain pygmy possum and it hibernates. So hibernation you might argue is a um, behaviour, I crawl into a cave and I just sleep for a while. Um, but hibernation actually involves a lot of very important physiological mechanisms. It has to slow down the heart rate a, a considerable amount in order for uh, this strategy to be successful. Um, the, the mountain pygmy possum is a very small organism. Uh, and it does live in environments where the temperature can drop very low. And so that means that what it has to do, if it's going to um, go into a state of torpor or short-term hibernation, is to get all of its metabolic processes very, very low. Um, the mountain pygmy possum can do this during the um, winters. Uh, in the environment that it lives in, it gets very, very cold and can snow in the winter time. And so that's one way that the animal can maintain its body uh, temperature, or at least maintain a lower body temperature by minimal activity. If you're a little animal and you're very active, you need a huge amount of energy, which means you need a huge food supply. So that, that takes a little bit of pressure off the organism um, by hibernating. You can see uh, in the next picture the bilby with its, um, its long, thin ears. There's blood supply in those ears. And those ears, you can see it's uh, in an environment where it's more likely to um, be very warm. 
And so it's going to be looking for strategies to help it cool. And there's a number of different organisms with similar sorts of um, strategies for trying to um, reduce uh, overheating or at least have strategies to try and regulate temperature. So we know that um, there's certain types of fennec foxes, for example, that have big ears that do the same sort of thing. And also um, even elephants with their very large ears can have a big blood supply passing through the ears that can then be cooled. Here we have a little fella known as the chameleon grasshopper. And this little grasshopper has, has an interesting strategy because it's able to change its color in response to temperature. If the temperature gets very low, below about 15 degrees, then this little, this little fella turns black, a sort of very dark shade of the green. But um, when it's warming, when it's basking in the sun, then it is a much paler, bluer colour. So you can see that this colour here is basically the sort of colour that we would expect when it's out in the sunshine, when its body temperature is a little bit warmer. But as the body, um, as the temperature drops, so the colour just slightly changes. And, and the fact that it's called a chameleon grasshopper gives you a little bit of an idea about that change in colour. And that may also be a, a um, a, a response to trying to draw more in. We know that darker colours are going to draw uh, more heat than lighter colours and so therefore when the temperatures are low the grasshopper is trying to make the maximum use that it can out of um, whatever heat energy or light energy there is available for it. One other example is the platypus. Now the platypus uses a strategy or a physiological adaptation which is known as countercurrent exchange. In countercurrent exchange, which is, which is a strategy that's employed by a number of different organisms that can find themselves in quite cold environments, if you think about blood coming from the heart through the arteries, it's going to be very warm. But if it's, if it's say, going towards the extremities, going towards the feet, where it's going to get uh, cool, then certainly when the, when the blood is travelling back through the veins from the feet, it can be quite cold. So the, so the system that works as a, a countercurrent exchange system has the artery and the vein very close together. So as the blood's coming from the heart, that heat can um, basically radiate out across and slowly warm that blood that's coming up through the vein back from the extremities so that it warms up a little bit before it gets into the, um, into the internal body cavity and certainly into key organs like the heart or the brain. So this sort of system of being able to use your own blood to warm other parts of the blood that are a little cooler is another physiological adaptation. And probably one of the best examples is the kangaroo. Now the kangaroo has a couple of interesting adaptations um, in its teeth, it, look, it has a, a process known as sequential eruption. So it doesn't produce all of its teeth at the same time. Some of the molars remain in the jaw, and as the animal ages, teeth at the front of the jaw, which are grinding up very harsh vegetation, are uh, worn down. And so the new ones from the back will push the ones forward and actually the, the animal will lose some of those front teeth as, as new ones from the back of the jaw come forward to replace them. So ultimately an animal will die of starvation if it lives long enough because it will have worn down all of those, uh, all of those teeth. But it also means that we can um, identify the age of, of kangaroos by looking at their jaws. The other thing that they do uh, is a process known as embryonic diapause. Kangaroos are, uh, have some incredible reproductive strategies where they can actually have joeys at different ages um, taking a milk which is slightly different so different nipples can actually produce different types of milk that may be richer uh, in fats than others and that's depending on whether it's just a very recent uh, birth uh, or whether it's a joey that's kind of um, not too far from being weaned. But the other thing that um, female kangaroos can do is they can actually pause the embryo at a certain stage of its development. If they know that the conditions are not good, um, that the chances of that baby surviving are not as, as high, it can actually pause the development at a certain part uh, and then restart that at some later stage when, when conditions improve. So these are all physiological adaptations. They're how the body works. And we'll have a look at a few more examples in class. Thanks for watching.